my name is Stefan Granier, and I'm a spokesperson of YIP, uh, which translates in English to Use for Israeli-Palestinian Peace, which is a Swedish organization for people uh, who identify as Jews. Uh, we are, uh, we have been existing since the early 80s, since the uh, war against uh, Israel and Lebanon, where there were many youths around the world who reacted towards uh, the Israeli warfare, and there was a international call for uh, with, under the name "Not in Our Name." Uh, and after that, there were several organizations formed. We have been since then then trying to work uh, mostly as a peace organization. We have uh, uh, tried to work to let's say. Uh, mantle down walls and build some kind of bridges between youth and uh, Palestinians. We do that in cooperation with many other organizations within, uh, for example, the umbrella organization Use for Israeli, uh, uh, Use for Just Peace, and with organizations on other places of the, uh, um, other other parts of the world. Uh, and of course, we also cooperate and try to learn from and to have information from many organizations in Israel and Palestine. Uh, and uh, as you have heard, the names of this organization, traditionally we worked a lot with the question of the peace process, the Oslo Accords and so on. But the further we go into this, when time goes, it's also been obvious that it is important to work with, sorry. Yeah. Neither do I. Try, and then we continue because we don't have that much time anyhow. Uh, so, uh, more and more, we've been aware of that it's also very important to work with human rights because people have been living for very many years under occupation and under these con conditions regarding both human rights and security. Uh, one of the organizations we then have been very useful for us is the Beth Salem organization, which is an excellent organization that uh, collects information and reports and uh, databases that we use, that I really could recommend. Uh, and we have with us today then uh, Droy Jelin from Beth Salem that we invite, invited here. So uh, you could also add something to the presentation of your organization. So um, I, my organization was established um, over a little over 30 years ago during the time of the first uh, Palestinian uprising against the Israeli occupation, 1989. Um, the assuming that there will be peace was also, also sort of the assumption of the people that uh, um, founded uh, B'Tselem, they did not think that I would be sitting here today, 30 years later, um, doing this type of work. Uh, in fact, in the, during, this is like an anecdote, but uh, just, uh, just to, to show uh, to what extent the belief that the peace is coming was prevalent in the end of, uh, towards the end of the 1990s, uh, the organization was really like making a plan for shutting down because the thought was that the Oslo process is going to um, to be like to finalize to reach final conclusion and then it would be like the work of other organizations uh, to do other things so they were really like discussing how to divide the funds how to shut down what to do with things and, and of course sadly that was not a situation so we still have the obligation to shut down we're still trying to do our best in order to do that but it doesn't seem like we're going to be out of business anytime soon um, the but this thought that the peace process is really like something tangible and will end up with a concrete result also was part of really like the, um, uh, the, the, the thing that propelled people to invest more in peace movements and to postpone and delay for later addressing the pressing human rights issues on the ground. Everybody thought that like, well, you know, 
the settlements, that's bad, that's illegal according to international law, but uh, in the final agreement, that will be sorted out. And uh, well, yeah, there are uh, restrictions of movement, and, uh, but, but when we have a peace agreement, that will end. And what we sort of uh, understood now that actually maybe it's, uh, it would be better to, to do it the other way around to start with human rights based approach and to demand uh, remedy for the violations that happen right now and that will probably bring peace sooner than saying peace now human rights later thanks uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about the could say current situation for uh, uh, trying to defend human rights under this situation we s will learn a little bit and you know much more about it, about the, let's say, uh, legal conditions on so how they changed and developed? Yes, the more, um, the more entrenched the, this method of controlling, subjugating people uh, has become, you also need more and more restrictions on, on other freedoms that were kind of like uh, a non-issue before. Um, so, of course, we have to stress that um, the oppression for Palestinian uh, is constant. It has been starting from the very, very beginning of the State of Israel. When Israel was founded in 1948, um, Palestinians were placed under military control that lasted until the year 1966. And then in 67, after the Six Days World, when Israel um, occupied the West Bank and, uh, and the Gaza Strip, um, the, this apparatus of military control, uh, military dictatorship was in place for them uh, and it was ready for the, for to, to, to include the, the, the Palestinians that, um, that were occupied then. And of course, uh, such a regime is not a regime like of where there is freedom of expression and, and, and dissent and everything like that. No, uh, from the very, very, f from the very, f very first month of occupation, uh, dissent, organizing, political protest, etc., is f was forbidden. Um, over the years, the 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 definition of what is allowed. Um, and, and, and not allowed is increased. And very, very recently, in October 2021, uh, six v leading civil society organization, Palestinians, were designated by Israel as terrorist organization. Those organizations are, you know, the leading organization in Palestinian society, doing fantastic, phenomenal human rights advocacy. None of them has ever uh, used violence against Israel, so it's really like, um, or, or against anyone else. Um, but Israel wants to criminalize human rights work in Palestine uh, to a large degree because uh, that's a, b a bigger threat for the legitimacy of this regime than anything that a terrorist uh, can, can perpetrate against Israel. In Israel itself, the situation, of course, is much better, and we're well aware that we're as positioned as a Jewish-Israeli organization, enjoy privileges that Palestinians don't. But also in Israel, in recent years, the climate um, is not as nice as, as it was before. Um, so there, there are laws that um, limit freedom of expression. Um, there are laws that are um, limiting the ability um, of, uh, co le let's say, I give you something like concrete, like calling for boycotting settlement products, that's illegal. Uh, in Israel, that will open you to a lawsuit and can cost you a lot of money, potentially. Um, it's forbidden to commemorate the Nakba, the deportation and forced displacement of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in the, at, at the time of the establishment of the State of Israel. Um, and also, uh, the environment has become toxic. Now, that is not solely an issue of legislation. That's also of a question of norms. Um, Israeli leaders have been 
targeting human rights activists and organization, uh, calling them traitors, foreign agents. We are forced um, by law to place uh, on everything that we advertise uh, sort of like a warning, like you have on a packet of cigarette that tells you it's bad, that smoking is bad for your health. So we have to label, label ourselves as the agents of foreign, uh, foreign entities. Um, we are um, maligned in the public discourse. Uh, and this is like part of the job. Um, it has been worse in the last couple of years. Uh, but it also triggered a lot of uh, positive response because uh, when people see that, they are forced to choose sides. And many people choose our side when they're confronted with what we're, they're saying about us. Uh, we see like usually when we're in the middle of this kind of negative campaign. So there's a lot of pressure and it's unpleasant and sometimes it feels dangerous. But on the other hand, there's also an outpouring of messages of support of small donations from people that try to know to show and express their uh, belief in what we're doing. And we actually sort of see that we're also gaining a little bit from this thing because when we're saying what we're saying about the Israeli regime, uh, sometimes people think that we're a little bit extreme or inaccurate. Uh, but when they say what they say and behave like they behave to privileged Jews like us, um, sometimes people kind of get it, and it shows their true colors. Thanks. Uh, maybe we should go in a little bit more into how you actually do this. What is, I mean, we see the result of what you're doing, but sometimes you could also wonder how, how is this actually made possible? and how do you reach the kind of information and, and, uh, uh, that you deliver to the world? So my organization, Betelem, uh is a monitoring organization. We're an information center. We, our method of, uh, of operation, we basically collect, verify information, investigate, and then we publish. Uh, we are not uh, and, um, um, uh, we're not litigating things. We don't go to the courts, uh, unlike other uh, human rights organizations. And the way we do it, we have, um, w basically, we're fact-based. So we collect information. We have 11 field researchers in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, so whenever something happens, they go there and investigate, uh, collect testimonies, collect forensic information. Uh, that information is then transferred to our office where there are what we call da data coordinators. Their responsibility is to verify this information and to collect even more uh, sources from um, formal and informal sources to scour the, the web and social networks because a lot of times people post now on TikTok and Facebook additional information or maybe they have like a, a clip or a, photograph, a photograph of something that will add or shed light on what happened. And we investigate um, all violations, but of course we have to, there, there's so much that happens. So we focus on the more severe violations, which means killings, violence, um, demolitions. Um, we have comprehensive statistics about those issues. Um, and we, re we we, re we research every um, killing that has been perpetrated in the context of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and on other issues, it's more to our judgment. If we think that something is uh, more important, then we devote time to research it and to, and, and to really like investigate. So now, for example, we're working on a big report about water, allocation of water between Jews and Palestinians. Um, we're writing about the legal situation in East Jerusalem. So we have, and, and for each of those things, we have experts that are advising us and helping us um, collect information and also publish things that are verifiable and true. Thanks. Uh, I'm thinking as a follow-up question that, that 
we who are kind of interested in and working w with these questions often realize that truth is not that easy to establish uh, when it comes to information that you get from these areas on both sides. So what are your kind of principles or how do you handle that? Um, yes, truth is like the first victim of war. That's, that's kind of like common knowledge. Uh, but it's also, um, it's also there's like a, what is called um, willing ignorance. A lot of people just don't try to get to know things. Um, and what we do is really like do very, very basic activities. Like if something happens, we go to the scene and then we kind of take, uh, if, if for instance it's like a wounding of somebody or somebody was shot, so we position people like we say like uh, where was the so where were the soldiers or whoever shot where was the victim we try to look around if there was like CCTV cameras that documenting what happened uh, we're collecting eyewit testimonies from eyewitnesses so we can cross reference them and we have our own rules about how we can corroborate things. Um, like uh, we have our own rules about what we can or cannot say. So let's say if I have only eye one eyewitness to something that is like pretty severe, I think that for most cases that would not be eno sufficient enough for us to publish um, description of the event because people's memory tend to be shady. Sometimes they don't remember things right. So I would need like at least at least more. Um, another testimony from somebody who didn't talk to that person to verify that or something else that will corroborate it like forensic evidence um, maybe there's a li um, um, an autopsy so that's like um, something that we can check uh, we do the necessary work in order to make sure that we're honest and truthful that doesn't mean that we're not making mistakes we're only human but um, if we find out that we made a mistake, then we correct it. We publish. We, we a lot of times, a lot of journalists get a, a text from me saying that, like, you know, we rechecked something, and and uh, what we concluded before is not uh, our conclusion right now. So we just try to be as transparent as possible and to stick to the facts as as much as we can. And if we're not sure, we simply will not say it. So collecting and organizing, or, uh, organizing information and uh, investigating is, of course, an important part of defending human rights. But I would say it's probably not enough. It's important that these things also are uh, becoming some kind of more widespread knowledge. So do you handle that? Um, yes, like uh, we're not, we don't want to be a museum or an archive. We're trying to influence reality so the most important thing for us is to get those the things that we collect outside to publish um, we are investing a lot of our effort in advocacy and a lot of and the other part in campaigning uh, we issue quite a lot of like press releases we take journalists on tour to see the facts on the ground to talk to people um, we organize also tours for decision makers. If there are like uh, visiting diplomats in our country, we try to contact them and to get them to go to the field and to see in their own eyes what we, what we know and to talk to, to people that are there. That's mainly like something which we like to facilitate because uh, the, the usual suspect that gets those people's ears are people that... Um, have like political interest in, like you said before, um, not really like uh, presenting reality for what it is, not being uh, describe it, not describing reality, but actually like uh, promoting a different distorted version of it. Uh, when we spoke before, uh, you said that uh, earlier, you said that you to a larger extent was addressing Israeli media and Israeli society, you still do, but you say that you found it important to to a larger extent reach out to global and international media. Uh, why is that? So, um, quite like the fact that if we thought that um, after um, 
the, the, the human rights, a lot of human rights issues will sort themselves out after peace arrives and peace does not arrive. Uh, we have to think about why that happened and how the situation will change. And we understand that the imbalance of power, the asymmetry that exists between Israelis and Palestinians, um, can be remedied only by the intervention of the international community. Um, if we look at the conflict, just like in general, and we think um, about um, powers, like about, about countries, um, Israel uh, is not, has a lot of f friends and has a lot of enemies. Uh, but it controls only one other people, which are, which are Palestinians. Um, this is because if, if Palestinians were stronger, then we would have one of two models of relationship with them. We would have either deterrence or a peace agreement, cooperation. Uh, the mode of control is possible only because Palestinians are weak. And in order to pressure Israel to have a different set of relationship with them, we need to give them strength. And that strength can come only from the support of the international community, of, from countries like Sweden, or from the European Union that will uh, pressure Israel and change this scenario by which it's more profitable for Israel to continue to control them rather than um, let them be equal and have their own free um, independence and f human rights. When you collect information, uh, you do that uh, basically as a Israel organization with office in Tel Aviv uh, collecting information about things happening mostly in occupied territories. Uh, how does that work like cooperating uh, and so on uh, on the other side of the green line? Um, our office is, is in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv, oh, but uh, um, well it works because uh, Palestinians uh, see us as, a, as a, an, an address. Uh, they think that uh, it's relevant to talk to us. Uh, without their trust and cooperation, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, in terms of like uh, our staff, we're like, I think like roughly half of our staff is uh, Palestinian. Uh, so they really like no, and and each of them, each of the field researchers, uh, is positioned in a certain area. Usually they're rather well known in that area. Um, by so people know that if something happens, they're relevant, um, relevant to talk to them. Um, my my experience, our experience, is that victims of violations of human rights want to share their stories. Um, they are well aware that uh, justice will not be served. They know that Israeli soldiers and settlers enjoy impunity from justice, but they still want people to know what happened to them. And because of that, they outreach either themselves or are happy to give testimony to our, to our field researchers or to share um, documentation of what happened. Um, we also give cameras to Palestinians all over the West Bank, and they give us the memory card afterwards of the, of the things that they collected. Uh, we also receive the, such information. I mean, everybody today, um, including in Palestine, have a smartphone. So sometimes they're not even volunteers, but they want us to share um, what they collected, um, and sometimes the strongest, uh, strongest items uh, that we have on our social media, or um, or, or in just like the the Israeli and international press, uh, is the material that we got from somebody who just something happened to them, and they knew that we would be able to make it. Um, um, you know, uh, widely circulated, whereas if, if they just post it on their own uh, social media or Facebook, it would not be uh, a, as strong. Um, for in, that res in that respect, even like our 
the most famous thing that we documented in, in recent years, which was the killing of a Palestinian assailant after he was already shot. He was lying wounded on the ground by another Israeli soldier. That was uh, the guy that gave it to us, was uh, somebody who volunteered with us in the past. It, this thing happened very close to where he lives in Hebron. And he, and he said like, yes, I know I'm not, I'm not a volunteer anymore, but I know that you will be able to do much better with it than I will uh, alone. And it was really like uh, the, the, the thing became the most covered story on Israeli media that year. That was um, a few years ago. And the name of the soldier that shot was Elor Azaria. Um, the, and I think like it's, if, if you Google that, you will see like the, there were like hundreds of different stories um, also in Sweden about it. Thank you. Actually, we have only a couple of minutes left now. I have a long list of questions, and it's actually grown during uh, this half an hour. So, but I know that uh, we have had also this situation here when it comes to relation between your organization and other organization, and how this could be debated, and in what kind of situation. And I know that you wanted to comment, this, comment that a little bit before we end. Uh, yeah, there was like uh, some sort of disinformation about us trying to video or cancel a uh, settler organization that kind of tried to ambush us um, here. Um, and I, j I really just wanted to stress that um, as a policy, my organization does not participate in debates that are for or against human rights, much the same as we will never uh, participate in debates uh, whose topic are anti-Semitism, yes or no. It's, it's legitimizing racism, and we're not part of such discussions. So therefore, this discussion did not take place. Thank you. Uh, well, there are actually one minute, but uh, this was the question that we decided to end it with. So let's uh, keep to that. And I will also remind everyone that we have since there is very little time for questions from the audience in uh, uh, this type of uh, arrangement. We have like a tea time at the Yip Monter uh, in let's say the upper corner here. So everyone is of course very welcome to come there and we will be there for a while, take questions and discussions and so on.